Hey y'all, welcome to Science and Engineering in KSP. I'm your host, Andy Leonard, and today we're going to be talking about the atmosphere of Kerbin. Now, I know last week I said we were going to talk about patched conics today, but I uh, just bought a graphics tablet, and it hasn't arrived yet, and I realized that it would be easier to talk about patched conics if I had a graphics tablet to draw out some of the shapes we need. So today we're going to be talking about atmosphere, and we're going to talk about launch, getting to orbit, the gravity turn, and re-entry which we're seeing here. And uh, we're gonna have a little bonus section tacked on where we're gonna talk about springs and dampers on landing legs. All right, let's dig in and look into Kerbin's atmosphere. So since about version one, I think, um, Kerbin's atmosphere has been modeled almost directly off of the Earth's atmosphere, except it's been scaled down by this kind of factor here, this conversion factor basically takes the Kerbin altitude input and spits out the corresponding Earth atmosphere value. So if we list these values out side by side where Z is the Kerbin altitude and H is the corresponding Earth altitude, we uh, get these different parameters here. And we see that uh, at one kilometer, the atmospheric conditions are gonna be like they are at uh, 1.25 kilometers, at 70 kilometers, on Kerbin, the atmospheric conditions are gonna be uh, what they're like at about 86.3 kilometers. And we find the Earth atmosphere, uh, atmospheric properties by the US Standard Atmosphere, which I think was first published in 1958, and it was revised over the next decade. And I think the, the final version that I'm using here is the 1976 version of Standard Atmosphere. Um, it turns out there isn't one nice simple equation that works for all segments of the atmosphere. I mean, you can model it that way, but you're going to be off by a little bit. So what they did was they split up the atmosphere into these seven different segments, and there are different uh, equations that they found that describe the pressure and the temperature in each segment. So what do these numbers tell us? Well, if we calculate the numbers and we plot them, we find that uh, this is the plot that describes the atmospheric pressure as a function of altitude. And I have it here plotted against the values at uh, the values on Kerbin. And we find that at sea level, so zero kilometers, we have an altitude that looks like to be about 101 kilopascals, which works because at sea level here on Earth, the atmospheric pressure is about 101 kilopascals. Uh, that's one atmosphere, basically. And you see as we uh, go up in altitude, the pressure drops until around uh, 30 kilometers, and then it's basically zero after that. There's some negligible pressure left after that. And the, the temperature plot looks a little bit funkier. Here's what it looks like. And it says that uh, we're, we have about 287 Kelvin at, uh, at sea level, and then we drop down, and it's roughly constant in this region here, and then it rises up a little bit and does all kinds of different funky things. Now, what about the, the density? This is the density in kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, we see that at sea level, the atmosphere has a density of about 1.2 something kilograms per cubic meter, which matches up. I think it's uh, 1.25 here on Earth at sea level. And again, as you uh, go up in altitude, the density drops along with the pressure, as you might expect. Engineers need a good density model because it helps them figure out the terminal velocity. Now, the terminal velocity is kind of the maximum speed that you want to go during atmospheric ascent because if you go any faster, then you are uh, using more propellant to fight drag force than to fight the force of gravity. And for, uh, terminal velocity is given by 2 times mass times gravity uh, over density times area times the coefficient of drag, all square rooted. And we're not going to really apply it too much today um, because there are a lot of things in here that change. The, the density is changing uh, with altitude and the mass is changing because we're burning up our propellant and stuff like that. And we have to use a lot of uh, integration and differential equations techniques to, uh, to be able to apply this very well, but it's just something that you should be aware of. 
Now, like I was saying, all the different factors that play in ascending flight, forces like changing weight due to burning propellant, atmospheric lift and drag, different thrust levels at different altitudes due to different ambient pressures, etc., make plotting an ascent uh, trajectory pretty hard to do. And in fact, we can't really do it analytically except for a few special cases. Figuring out the particulars of a gravity turn is done with gnarly things like differential equations that we have to solve numerically using programming languages. Uh, and we might come back and do this someday, but not today. What we're going to do today is walk through the general gravity turn maneuver that KSP players know and love, and then try and automate the process using Kerbal Operating System. So you can see I started off uh, launched from about a five degree angle from the vertical, and it's always good practice to start off a little bit inclined, maybe not quite that much, uh, but that's the lowest you can do in stock KSP in the VAB. And we usually start the gravity turn at about uh, 4,000 or 5,000 kilometers by turning off stability assist and letting our changing mass do the work for us. And what's happening here is as the rocket gets more top heavy as the propellant is burned, we're going to tip over a little bit and rely on the lift and drag inducing properties of the vehicle, including the uh, fins down there on the bottom to keep us stable. And these great fiery streaks of plasma that we're seeing here are a pretty good indication that we've reached max Q or maximum dynamic pressure, which is the point at which your velocity combined with the density and other stuff like that uh, makes the pressure load the highest it is in the ascent trajectory. And when we start the second stage here, we are going to turn the SAS back on uh, because the second stage isn't as stable. If we didn't have SAS here just because of the way I, you know, threw this little guy together, he would uh, go wiggling all over the place. And we are just going to point horizontally and uh, prograde and finish our orbit and circularize. And once we're done burning to circularize, circularize here, we're going to see that we have 2013 meters per second of delta V remaining. Uh, so let's try it out with an automated uh, ascent trajectory and see how close to that number we can get and see if we can improve on it. So running the script that I wrote in KOS, we are going to begin the turn maneuver at 7,000 meters and we're going to pitch down at a constant rate of 1 degree every 0.71 seconds until we get a final flight path angle of 3 degrees and from there we will uh, continue our orbital insertion. So now that we have the same Apo apps as before, what we're going to do is we're going to plan a maneuver and see how much delta V we'd have to spend to circularize and get into orbit. And once we do that, what we find is that we're left with 2,000 meters per second of delta V remaining, which is a little bit worse than flying it manually, but we can take some of the guesswork out of the trajectory planning. Now for other launch vehicles, we would want to play around with it a little more because by tinkering around, we found a trajectory automation script that works well for this specific vehicle, but wouldn't necessarily work for the others. Let's move on and talk about re-entry. Now like ascent trajectories, the math behind re-entry is governed by difficult to solve differential equations, but there's really good news. We can approximate a lot of the interesting information using the Allen Eggers equation. What, uh, what we need to do is we just need to know our entry velocity and flight path angle. Now let's get this sucker on a uh, descent deorbit trajectory and then we'll observe the velocity and angle at an initial entry uh, at 70 kilometers and then we'll pop over to a Python script to see what we can learn. And so when we zoomed ahead in our orbit to a point where our uh, height was 70 kilometers, we found that we'd have a flight path angle of 5 degrees measured downward from the horizontal and an atmospheric velocity, uh, atmospheric entry velocity of uh, 2,250 meters per second. 
and what we do is we, we, we put those off to the side and then we put in some, some constants about uh, Kerbin and about our ship. We, uh, we need the acceleration due to gravity, which in 1.1.3 is 9.82, but this has been corrected in 1.2. Uh, we need the radius of Kerbin. We need the Stefan Boltzmann constant and the Sutton Graves constant, and these will help us figure out things about the, the thermal effects that we're going to undergo. We get the atmospheric density at sea level that we found earlier, the average temperature in the atmosphere, the specific gas constant, the scale height, the uh, heat shield diameter and area, and the mass of the capsule at entry. Now, KSP doesn't really have a good way to give you the coefficient of drag, so I just basically pulled this one out of, uh, out of thin air. Um, and you need the ballistic co coefficient too, which is mass divided by drag coefficient times area. And so what do we do? We, uh, we get the Allen Eggers constant first, and that tells us that uh, our, our constant that we're gonna plug into an equation to get velocity is negative uh, density at sea level times scale height divided by two times ballistic coefficient times the sine of the flight path angle. And what we do with that coefficient is, is we plug it in and we take the entry velocity and multiply it times e to the c times e to the uh, negative altitude uh, over scale height. And what we do, uh, what we find when we do all that is that this is what our velocity profile is going to look like. And you see that we're, we're mostly constant velocity here up until about uh, 45 kilometers and then we, uh, we hit the thickest, soupiest parts of the atmosphere and um, it exerts a force on us and we start to slow down pretty rapidly. And what we can also do is we can find the altitude of maximum deceleration and the magnitude of that max deceleration. And using these equations, we, uh, we plug in what we know and we find that our, uh, our altitude of max deceleration is 34 kilometers and the max acceleration is only 1.2 Earth Gs, which is a very, very gentle ride. And uh, the, the shallower you go in, the kind of a, the cushier ride you're going to have. And we can also figure out some of the, uh, the heating characteristics of our heat shield. To find the heat rate, we need a nose radius, which uh, I kind of arbitrarily chose. I wasn't too clear on how to, uh, to find that, given what we knew about the capsule. So I chose 0.4. Yeah. And um, so to find the heat rate, you take the Sutton Graves constant, take the square root of density over the nose radius, and then you multiply it by velocity cubed. And when you do that, you see that your heat rate is uh, is here, and our peak heat rate is just a little bit over a hundred thousand watts per square meter, and it happens at an altitude of about I don't know I'd say uh, 33, 34 kilometers. But we can also find our temperature too. Um, we first need the emissivity of the material, which is basically its its uh, ability to conduct heat, and you want you want pretty high emissivity for heat shield stuff. Uh, go look on YouTube. There's some pretty cool videos of folks taking blow torches and uh, and and using them on the space shuttle's tiles, and then pulling the blow torch away, and within just a few seconds, the tile was had uh, cooled down enough to be safe to touch. So that's what you want for a heat shield. You want something that can just kind of conduct heat and get rid of it really, really easily. And we find that our uh, temperature is going to be equal to the heat rate divided by the emissivity times the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And we take the fourth root of all that. And here's what our temperature profile looks like as we descend. And uh, we see our peak temperature again occurs at uh, 33 or 34 kilometers, and it's about 1,200 Kelvin, which uh, which makes sense if we uh, we convert that to Celsius, that would be 1473 uh, degrees Celsius, and the max temperature allowable by the space shuttle I think was 1510 degrees Celsius. So uh, we're we're getting we know we're getting pretty realistic numbers. Well, that about wraps it up for uh, re-entry effects. Um, let's switch over and talk about springs and dampers on landing lights. 
Now, YouTube user Stefan Sirikov watched my 50 subscriber special where I screwed around with the landing legs a bit on the lander can, and he wanted to know a little bit more about how the springs and dampers and landing legs work. Um, and funnily enough, this is another one of those cases where we're not going to be able to solve it directly because it's a pretty nasty differential equation that describes the motion of spring uh, and dampers in masses and systems. And so this is the general equation of motion here. Uh, you have m times acceleration uh, plus the damping constant times velocity plus spring constant times displacement is equal to some force or some excitation, which we just call f of t. And then we, we divide through by mass to get this second equation here, and then we make some substitutions. We say that the natural frequency of the system, omega sub n, is equal to the square root of k over m, and then we say that zeta, the coefficient of viscous damping, is equal to the damping constant over 2 times the square root of mass times the spring constant. And then we get this equation that we work with here. Um, x double dot plus 2 zeta omega n x dot plus omega n squared x equals f of t. Um, and we, there are all kinds of different situations that you can apply this in. And there's, you can solve it for critically damped, over damped, under damped, um, and in all kinds of different ways. And we're not really going to be able to do much of that in KSP because we don't really have much information about the damping constant or the spring constant and we it's we can't even really find the the distance it's really hard to 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 find the distance that your landing leg would would sink or, or move or whatever and the acceleration and the velocity are pretty much the same story but um, if you're interested um, I invite you to, to, to look up and, and see more about how this works and if you can you can do the differential equations on it pretty easily then let me know because sometimes I need help with that myself. So what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over to KSP and we're just going to play around with some of the sliders and uh, see the effects of changing your spring strength and damper strength. So let's start off by running just the general default case of spring strength of one and damper strength of one. Now what a spring does is it uh, it kind of it'll bounce and it'll convert the energy that it's receiving into motion and the damper will try to kill all that energy and, and just absorb it and do nothing with it. So this should be a familiar sight hopefully. Um, drop on the ground and nothing much happens. But what happens when we tweak the spring strength all the way down and we have damper strength still set to 1? And we'll drop there and you see how low that we uh, go down before it pops back up. Um, but if we tweak it up to 2 and um, try and have it absorb all the energy of the impact and, uh, and just get rid of it as much as possible, what do you think happens? <laughs> and that is kind of a bug in 1.1.3. Um, landing legs blow up when they're overstressed. They're just supposed to break, I think. I think they fixed that in 1.2. Um, one of these days I'll have to get with the times and download it. Um, but that day is not today. So what happens when we crank up the springs and uh, all the way up and crank the damper all the way down? Well, this is actually kind of fun. Um, I'm going to have to take this lander can here to Minmus because don't you think it would just be fun hopping around in really, really small uh, gravity using that? I think it would be pretty funny. And we're upside down and our poor little Kerbal is sitting there like, what is happening? Um, and so I'm just going to close out here and kick the spring strength down to about 1.2 and bring the damper strength up to 1. I, I, I like this configuration. It, it, it uh, has some weight to it and it just feels satisfying. Nice little plop. <laughs> and yeah. Drop it down there. Nice satisfying thud. And that brings this episode to a close. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you had fun watching it. I had fun making it. And I'll see you next week where we will talk about patched conics for realsies.